In an orderly way. I mean, we, we did have a problem. You go back to September uh, of 2008 when Lehman went under and the financial markets froze. That was a problem. Um, I, I wouldn't say that was a good thing if we could, we don't want to see that happen again. I'll, I'll say two things about that. One, that was not the end of the world. I don't want to be there again. I'll be real clear. I don't want to be there again. But it was not as though the world was about to end. We would have been in an unpleasant circumstance where if things had kept going down that path, the Fed basically would have had to step in and take over the banks. They actually had a plan to do that in, in, in the 80s when uh, Latin American debt had left many of the big money center, center banks then too also on the edge of insolvency. And as I heard from the former head of the FDIC, the Fed at that time had a contingency plan that had Mexico or one of the other big debtors defaulted, outright defaulted, they simply was stepped in and taken over the banks. Presumably, we would have looked at that sort of situation. That wouldn't have been good, but the idea that the economy just would have come to a screaming halt and we'd all be sitting here without uh, being able to use our credit cards, not get access to money in our bank account, that might have been 24 hours, something like that, a scary period, but the economy would not have grown to a halt. So the worst case scenario, just to be clear, it was not we'd all be sitting here with a, a 21st century economy, but no means of payments. That would not have happened. But the second point is we have a lot of mechanisms, a lot of safeguards that were put in place post Lehman. So we now guarantee deposits up to 250000 We guarantee all non-interest bearing deposits. We're guaranteeing money market mutual funds. So there's a lot of safeguards in place today that were not in place back in September of 2008. So if we were to have a controlled bankruptcy of a Citigroup, of a Bank of America, I'm fairly confident that we can get through it. I can't say for 100% certain that we won't have, again, a sort of panic that we had back in September, but I think there's good reasons to believe that we won't have that. And again, even in that very worst case scenario, which I don't think would happen, but even in that very worst case scenario, we are prepared to deal with that with extreme measures, which again, none of us want to see, but I think that might be better. The risk of that might be better than just perhaps giving as much as a trillion dollars to the banks. I think what you have is a situation that's normal, enormous pressure for conformity, um, certainly among economists. So when you had top economists, certainly uh, Federal Reserve Board Chair Greenspan, uh, Bernanke, his successor, saying there was no bubble, and many other prominent economists agreeing with that view, um, most economists didn't want to step out of line and, and either contradict them or for the most part, they probably never even looked at it closely. And you did have, I was out there talking about this since 02. There were a few others, not a lot but we're easy enough to ignore. So I think most economists are relatively narrowly focused on their careers and picking a fight with the Federal Reserve Board Chair generally isn't the best way to advance your career. So the, to take the flip side of this, if you go, okay, who's suffered a price? Who, who's lost their job? Or let's put it even more narrowly, who's missed a promotion because they didn't see the housing bubble? And you'd probably be hard pressed to find anyone. So looking at economists the way economists would look at other people, if you say, what are the structure of incentives? Well, the structure of incentives to go around talking about a housing bubble, it just doesn't pay because, one, you could be wrong. Um, you know, I was pretty confident of what I was saying, but none of us are perfect. You know, so you could be wrong, in which case you'll, you'll be a laughing stock. Um, and in the meantime, you, you know, if you go the other way, if you just say the same thing that Alan Greenspan says, no one holds it against you. So you take a really big risk by stepping out of line, very little obvious payoff. I mean, you know, I get a little more, some more interviews or whatever, but it's not, uh, I haven't gotten rich by this. And if, if, you, if you just say the same thing as every, everyone else, you basically bear no risk, no consequence. It doesn't surprise me they're not lending out the money. We, we were given many, many different explanations for the TARP at the time they were trying to push it through. Basically, they were throwing everything against the wall and seeing what would stick. What made sense was that you had banks that were on the edge of insolvency and needed money to keep from going under, and I think that was true. And in that context, it's not the least bit surprising that they're not anxious to lend money. They have to build up their, their, their loss reserves. On top of that, one of the big reasons why they're not lending money is there aren't good, good borrower, good creditors out there, uh, good debtor options. So they're not seeing people come to them who look like good credit risk right now, so they're going to be very hesitant to lend money. So that, that's not all that surprising to me. Now, the Goldman Sachs story is one that's really amazing. They're saying they don't want, this is no way to run a business. That, that's, that's what uh, Lloyd Blanken from the CEO said of Goldman Sachs. Well, no, it's not. But on the other hand, you just took $12.9 of public money given to you through AIG. You, you did business with a bankrupt company. 
So you're out of luck there. But the federal government stepped in and said, no, we're going to honor AIG's obligations. We have no legal or moral obligation to do that. And we handed them $12.9 billion through AIG, no strings attached. On top of that, he borrowed $25 billion with an FDIC guarantee. Now, I haven't looked at the market spreads closely, but I, I have to believe that must save him at least two percentage points against what he'd have to pay if he didn't have a government guarantee. So that comes to $500 million a year. On top of that, he has access to several different Fed, Fed lending facilities. We don't know how much he's borrowed there, but what that means is he could count on getting money from the Federal Reserve Board at a lower rate than he would pay through the market, almost without limit. I mean, I assume at some point, Ben Bernanke, the Fed chair, would say, I'm not going to lend to you. But certainly, he can get tens of billions of dollars, if not hundreds of billions of dollars without limit. So he's telling us, OK, I'm happy to get money through all these three channels that have no strings attached. But when it comes to your TARP money that strings attached, no, I don't want it. Well, yeah, I understand him wanting to do that. But I don't have much sympathy for that. So I'm more inclined to say, fine, give up all your money. Give us back the $12.9 billion repay those loans that you, you took out with FDIC backing, swear off going to the Fed windows, and fine, then no strings attached. But this is, this is classic nanny state. He wants the money, he doesn't want the strings. We'd all like to have that, but most of us aren't CEO at Goldman Sachs.